So good afternoon to everyone. Welcome to Sabbath services here in Orinda. Greetings to those who are online. Hopefully I can project myself through the fabric and uh, be clear. I already asked Mr. Pepworth for forgiveness. We'll get into that. <laughs> Sorry about that. I just may need it. I don't know. A couple of weeks ago, Mr. Pepper shared the idea that we need to be comforters. Are we comforters? And I mulled that over. Oh, I should start my own time. I mulled that over with who are my comforters? I've had a, good, a wonderful comforter over the years. His name was Rex Spears. And he and I shared formally and informally a number of discussions over the years. Uh, I actually have a list here of some of them. View from the Great White Throne Judgment, the Prayer of Jabez, so who is in charge, Sin, Romans 5.12, and Sin Enters the World, 100 Years, How Much Have I Grown, How Much Do I Trust God, From Spiritual Milk to Solid Food, Ezekiel and Revelation, Temple Comparison, Discernment, did we have a successful feast? Death, you know, life and death. The outline of the revelation. Can we fail? An anointing study. Am I a lazy Christian? A good name. Truth, where can we find it? The night to be much observed. Humility. Four Passovers. And the last one he, he and I chatted about was unity. The calendar and Matthew 16. Mr. Spears was my comforter, and we comforted each other with the words of God. We shared those words with each other. We journeyed through those words. Mr. Spears was a minister of Jesus Christ. He kept his focus on the journey and the words of life, and over the years, we had common discussions of his words. One of his regrets was, as his health failed, was he, the inability to teach to be up here and to present. And even as we offered a chair and a table, that proved too much. But he and I would sit and talk on the internet, we would talk on the phone, and we would comfort one another. We would share and rehearse the words of life. I decided that I'm gonna share some of Mr. Spears' words with you. Words that he didn't have a chance to share. You might think that I, I was lazy and I didn't want to do a sermon. <laughs> not the case, not the case. But over the last couple of weeks, I was taken by how much Mr. Spears had an impact on my life and certainly may have had one on you, yours as well. I do not have his profound, deep basso profundo voice or his presence, but I have his words. What follows now is a sermon of multiple, I, if you like titles, the title is A Potpourri of Comfort, because I have a couple, three messages I want to share from Mr. Spears. Did I get a water? Get a little water. So this is from Mr. Spears. How much do we trust God? It's a short piece, which we had a wonderful discussion on. It is an interesting question that we should apply in many different situations. When we are sick and get anointed, we are asking God to heal us. Sometimes we have a job crisis. Maybe we are in danger of losing a job and we pray and ask God for his help. But there is another area we need to meditate on. Do we trust God to give us the messages on the Sabbath that we need? Let's face the facts. Some people are just better speakers than others. All speakers have bad days. But for every sermon, do we pray and really expect that God will inspire the messages we need? Maybe God is testing us to see just how much we really love his word, or are we, like the world, looking for entertainment? 
One of the problems Beyond Today faces is that the average attention span of a viewer is 18 minutes, while the program is 30 minutes long. When I first came into the church, Mr. Spears speaking, way back in the last millennium, an evangelist named Gerald Waterhouse used to come through on tours. There we were on a week night with two small children listening enthralled for two to three hours. Even then we were left wanting more. My first introduction, age, when I finally started attending church, was Mr. Waterhouse, one month into attending services in, in uh, 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 Lakeland, Florida. It was a three hour message. Today, Satan has so manipulated us that we can, if not very careful, completely miss God's inspired message for the day. This is true not only for Sabbath, but also true for the holy days. Some people miss services at the Feast of Tabernacles because they want to go out and do something fun. After all, God only commands us to go on the first and last day, right? Then why did God go to all the trouble to give us seven days of messages and fellowship? Maybe there are points given on one of the other five days or perish a thought in the middle of a boring sermon that God wants us to dig out to show that we really realize just how sobering and dangerous the times we live in. It is easy to see the danger in a hurricane hitting the East Coast. But we need to recognize the dangers we face every day in Satan's world. God inspires the messages that we hear, but it is up to us what we do with that information. Mr. Spears is a comforter to me, even now. Another piece, Am I a Lazy Christian? This was written in September. I keep asking myself a very basic question. With all that is going on in the Bay Area, what am I supposed to be learning from the experience? This is Mr. Spears, 50 plus years in the ministry, serving from the sidelines, still wondering how to, to help. I have, the, excuse me, I have the feeling in the back of my mind that I am missing something. Jesus warns us about having planks in our eye. He does not say to look and see if we have a plank or, or planks, but that we actually do have planks. And suddenly a question came into my mind. Am I a lazy Christian? Goes to Acts 17, verse 10. Acts 17, verse 10. He says, this is a story I have read many times and used in sermons, but I have to ask myself if I understand why the Bereans grew spiritually unlike the Jews of Thessalonica. Thessalonica, Thessalonica, that place. I got a mask in front of my face. That's my excuse. Acts 17, verse 10. Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Paul never hesitated. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and search the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. They received it with readiness and then confirmed what was being said. The Bereans received the word with all written. But notice the next step. They searched the scriptures daily to find out if these things were so. They did not just take Paul at his word. Why? Because they knew what we call the Old Testament contained the word of God and that was their final authority. Therefore, verse 12, therefore many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. When Rita and I first started taking the 35 lesson Bible study course, we both had a notebook and we hand copied every verse. That was a long, tedious process, but we knew and knew that we knew that the, what the scriptures said. Many people, both men and women, read and believe, at least for a while, what was written in the Bible study. In the early 90s, we heard, I heard more than one person say that God would make sure that the head of the church would keep, keep the church on track. That was true as long as the head of the church was alive, but Satan is very patient. When the head of the church died, Satan slowly closed the trap and destroyed the church. They stopped keeping God's way. 
He said, I had to do some very heavy meditating on that in that year. Hebrews 3.1 tells us a very basic truth. Hebrews 3.1. He says, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Jesus Christ, who was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all his house. Who was Jesus before his human birth? The Logos, the Word, which brings us back to the Bible. Paul warned the Ephesian, the Ephesian elders and us of just how dangerous even the church could be. Acts 20, Acts 20, verse 27. Acts 20, verse 27, going forward. He says, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. The word shunned is to draw back or let down or withdraw myself. He was always in the forefront of the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church which he purchased with his own blood. We are in training to be kings and priests, or if you prefer, a kingdom of priests in the wonderful world tomorrow. And Satan hates that idea that he will be replaced. Verse 29, for I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. This is Paul saying when he dies, there will be those who will tear into the church. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up within the church, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. This was on Mr. Steer's mind. He says, I have a confession to make. While I am on dialysis, I listen to sermons that I have downloaded. Some that I have listened to are my own sermons. You know what the hardest thing it is for a minister to do? Apply to himself what he is preaching. Apply to himself what he is preaching. Think about that. He says, I love the Beyond Today TV program and Beyond Today magazine. Both are aimed at the world. We are preaching the gospel wherever God will open the door. And the door has not yet been opened throughout the entire world. And I want to emphasize that little world word yet. One day he will, and we will have to be prepared to walk through that door. Question, once you are in the church, how does God teach us? Through the Bible, through his word, Hebrews 4, verse 12, Hebrews, Hebrews 4, verse 12. He says, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. When I study, I am asking God to bring me face to face with my biggest enemy, myself. And God tells us not to worry. God tells us not to worry. Verse 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. When studying any of the fundamental beliefs of the church, you pull up information. Let me read this again. When studying any of the fundamental beliefs of the church, pull up the information that the internet gives you. Then it is important to look up every scripture, every scripture they reference. If possible, write those scriptures down that imprints it on your mind. Study the context of each, each verse. He says, before you start, ask God to give you the understanding that you need to truly understand each scripture. If you remember at the end of Matthew, 
it says that Jesus Christ opened their understanding to the scriptures. That is something we should ask. He says, until you finish, do not look to, at the internet to see what man has to say, no matter what his credentials. Amos 3, verse 7. Amos 3, verse 7. Surely the Lord does nothing unless he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. You know, go to the, go to the uh, concordance, look up servants, the prophets. Is there any scripture in the Bible that says this will not apply in the last days because we'll have the internet? Mr. Spears could always give a nudge, nudge, and a poke when necessary. He then says, remember John's warning, 1 John 2, 4. 1 John 2, 4. He was concerned that so many are taken by the credentials of, of, this, of, of men and, and women of this world. He says, 1 John 2, verse 4, he says, I know him. Uh, he who says I know him and does not his commandments is a liar. And the truth, the truth is not in him. Do the people come giving you information on the internet keep all the commandments, including the fourth, especially the fourth? If not, extreme caution should be used, especially when studying doctrine. I have come to the conclusion that relying on the internet, even listening to UCG's own website without studying scriptures, directly makes me a lazy Christian. I am going to dedicate this feast, this is um, 2020, I'm going to dedicate this feast to waking this Christian up. He says, I cannot change anyone else. I can just change myself. Mr. Spears was my comforter, was my friend. A third message, which may be a little longer, I think I may have time to get the whole thing in. We'll see. He says, moving from spiritual milk to solid food. Like I said, it was a potpourri of comfort. Hebrews 5, verse 12. Hebrews 5, verse 12. He says, when you begin learning about God's way from the, apart from the world, usually the first thing we run into is the Sabbath day. For me, that was very true. That was the very first thing I learned. The next big step is understanding the feast days in the old, the uh, feast days, in the Old Testament, spell out the steps in God's plan of salvation. It's an understanding of why we're here and where we're going. If you have grown up in the church, the Sabbath and the Holy Days are something you may take for granted. When we are baptized, we are beginning a journey that lasts a lifetime. And as we, as we go through the years, we begin to realize that each step of the journey is built on the steps before. It's like a large pizza, pizza made it's on a large, boy, I did read that as pizza too. It is like a large puzzle made up of eight pieces. This whole time looking at these notes, I read pizza with eight pieces. It is like a large puzzle made up of eight pieces. The eight feast days are found in Leviticus 23. But each of those pieces are a puzzle themselves made up of many pieces. When I say eight, if you look at Leviticus 23, it's not just the high days, but the first feast of God is today, the Sabbath. It just happens to be 52 times a year. But each of those pieces are a puzzle themselves made up of many pieces. The Sabbath points back to creation and forward to the millennium. It is also a sign between God and his people, a weekly recharging of our spiritual body, batteries. And it is also linked to the two great commandments. Matthew 22, you can put this in your notes. I'll just read it. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. To me, that was Mr. Spears. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Mr. Spears had great love for you. He had great love. Hebrews 5, verse 12. You know, we, these are in turn, the, the, the great commandments are broken down into the Ten Commandments, which are also a puzzle. 
themselves over the years. As you fill in the pieces, the picture becomes clearer. Hebrews 5 and verse 12. The scripture has really got me to thinking. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, and, and for those in San Jose and Eureka, you know that has been the, the foundation of my teaching because I want you to be teachers of God's way. This isn't a journey where you, let me tell you what to do. You're learning to tell other people the truth and, how, and teach them God's way. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk, not solid food. We need to consider the little word again. This is something that they had previously known, but somehow that knowledge was beginning to slip away. And Paul then gives a warning, verse 13. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. There is a difference between 30 years experience and one year's experience 30 times. I have said this so many times over the years, it has become trite. Unfortunately, saying it repeatedly does not make it untrue. Verse 14, but solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern what both good and evil. That's a huge scripture. And that brings up the question of what is milk and what is solid food. Chapter 6 brings us some answers. Chapter 6, verse 1. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection. Not laying again, one, the foundation of repentance from dead works, and two, of faith toward God, three, of the doctrine of baptisms, four, of the laying on of hands, of the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. Paul shows just how serious this is. This can affect eternity. Verse 4, For it is impossible for those who once were enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. See, this is not talking about someone who hears the Beyond Today program, thinks it's interesting, but then does nothing. Verse 6, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful to those by whom it is cultivated receives blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to becoming cursed, whose end is burned. Let us be clear. This is a judgment that only God can make. But the third resurrection is not a myth. Now let us look briefly at these six points. The foundation of repentance from dead works. Look at some of the great works that man has done. The Forbidden City and the Great Wall of China, the Taj Mahal, the pyramids, the list can be endless. None of us can come close to matching what Solomon did. His great building projects, including the temple, are truly legendary, yet all that remains are stories. We should also remember that the temple of Jesus' time was built by King Herod, you know, a man not known for his virtue. And all that remains is a foundation. Solomon left behind him a divided kingdom. He said, Rex says, I worked for Del Monte for 43 years. I held a number of positions of importance. At one time, I had to say on spending more money uh, than the church had to spend when the church was at its height. That's $200 million. Did it make my work more important? Than the church? Not even close. Twelve years later, few remember my name. Were those years a waste? Hardly. What was important was the character that experience helped me to build. What was important was the character that experience helped me to build. John 1. John 1. The second mention... Uh, 
of the six mentioned is faith toward God. John 1, verse 26. Too often, unless things really get bad, we rely on ourselves and not God. You know, we're self-assured, we're, we're competent in ourselves, we're capable, so we rely on ourselves. Too many people have what is referred to as a hip pocket God. We only take them out when we need them. This is not walking with God, which means having God involved in your life all the time. There is an old saying, there is no such thing as an atheist in a foxhole during a battle. But what happens once you get out of the foxhole? A lot of people started attending church, suddenly came back to church right after 9-11. But as the weeks went by and nothing else happened, they gradually disappeared back into the world. They were no longer worried about saving their own skins. Back in December 25th, 1991, an event occurred that I believe had an enormous impact on the Church of God. The Soviet Union ceased to exist. Suddenly, everything we thought we knew about prophecy was in question. Then a few years later, someone came and said, well, you don't have to keep the Sabbath. And since the Holy Days are not really commanded for the church, we can keep them in the summer when it is more convenient. And what does food have to do with salvation anyway? And in less than a few years, a majority of the church went back into the world. It was a very difficult time, 1995. The church was not affected by a wave of persecution, but by a wave of deception. The third point Paul mentioned is the doctrine of baptisms. Notice that the word baptisms is plural. Again, John 1, 26. John answered them saying, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. Verse 29, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. You know, physically, John was six months older than Jesus. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. Verse 32, and John bore witness saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Thousands of people get baptized around the world every year, but only God decides if they are truly repentant, and worthy of receiving the Holy Spirit. And he says, I hate using the word worthy since no one is truly worthy of receiving the Holy Spirit. There's a lot more to study about this, this story. Acts 18, verse 24. Acts 18, verse 24. As I said, this, this will be a little different sermon today. Acts 18, verse 24, now a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and, and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. You know, some men are just born speakers. Often it is a gift that they were born with, and, he was, and this man was a scholar as well. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, being fervent in spirit. He spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. He was not complete in his studies. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. These verses I find extremely interesting. He spoke accurately the truths that he knew, but apparently there were things that Apollos had not yet come to understand. It does not say, it does not say, it does not say so, but somewhere in the story, Apollos must have had hands laid on him to receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit guides us to all understanding. It's a requirement. John 14, 26. John 14, 26. 
know Mr. Pepperworth used this two weeks ago. But the helper, the comforter, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring you to remembrance all things that I said to you. Without the Holy Spirit, we are limited in what we can understand. Those of you that, have, that are growing up in the church have been taught about the Sabbath, the holy days and the commandments by your parents. Sooner or later, you must be willing to put your life in the hands of your spiritual father. You need to make a choice. Or your education can never be complete. The fourth is laying on of hands. Acts 2, verse 37, 38. This is the beginning. This is uh, when Pentecost began. 50 days after the death of Jesus Christ. Roughly. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. Peter had given an impassioned speech, sermon, and the rest of the and said to Peter and the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent, and every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What we do is we start by repenting from where we find ourselves and change our life. We start keeping the Sabbath. But are we truly sorry for the mistakes we made before being called? We become aware of, of what we need to do to, to repent. And then, and only then, should we be baptized. Acts 19, Acts 19, verse 1. And it happened while Apollos was in Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, and to me this is astounding because this is where the rubber meets the road. This is 1 Corinthians 2. Sorry, that, that's not Rex, that's me. And he, they said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. They understood repentance. They understood the need to be baptized and have their sins forgiven. But they didn't understand that there was a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, verse 3, into what then were you baptized? So they said, into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptizing, baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Jesus Christ. There is nothing here to indicate that these people were not repentant, but they still lacked something. Verse 5, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Interesting. They were baptized a second time, but this time with the knowledge of Jesus as Lord and Savior. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in languages and prophesied or had inspired teaching. There was an immediate impact on what these people could do. Up to that point, God was just laying the foundation for their calling. That was their decision time. Acts 13, verse 1. Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menea, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. Then, having fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and sent them away. Repent, be baptized, have land, hands laid on, and receive God's Holy Spirit. Just for reference, 1 Timothy 4, um, give it attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not be, neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy or inspired teaching with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Laying on of hands. The church of God is not a democracy. It is a theocracy ruled by God, the Father, and Jesus Christ. People cannot appoint themselves ministers. God makes the choice. God separates those 
to, for the job and the assignment that he gives them. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands, 2 Timothy 1. Now, the fifth is the resurrection of the dead. Resurrection of the dead, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13. Mr. Spears goes on, it is not my purpose to prove the three resurrections, but to remind us of the wonderful understanding that we have. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. And all of us have had someone in our lives fall asleep. Lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. We know the fate of loved ones who have died in the faith. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus shall we always be with the Lord. Check something. I think I want to continue that thought. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, um, Mr. Spear stopped one scripture shy because this was him. Verse 18, therefore, comfort one another with these words. We're comforters for one another. And we use God's word to comfort each other. You know, someone in our life dies, we know that they're just asleep. That there is a future, that there is tomorrow. Some people would say that this is proof of the, res of the rapture. But what Paul is really saying is our eternity is assured. We will be with the Lord on that day. He is going to be on the Mount of Olives. That's in Zechariah 14. You can go to Revelation 20, Revelation 20, verse 4, again talking about the resurrections. And he said, I saw th thrones and they sat on them and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark in their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But, verse 5, but the rest of the dead. The rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. Verse 11. We also know that there is hope for the rest of mankind, for all humanity. They are not going to spend eternity in a Dante's hell. Verse 11. And I saw a great white throne judgment and him who sat on it from whose face the earth and heaven fled away and there was, no, was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before God. The books were open and another book was open, which is the book of life. That's just a, this is me aside now. That's what we're doing right now. The books are open. It's in your lap. You have the word of God in your lap. And when we are baptized, when we are given God's Holy Spirit, our name is written in the book of life. So we have individuals who have been resurrected at the return of Jesus Christ. This doesn't apply to them. At the end of a thousand years, all humanity will be resurrected, Ezekiel 37, to a physical life. And they will have the books open, just like we have today. And as they grow spiritually. They'll have their name put into the, the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Verse 13, there's a separation here. Now the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. This is a different group. And they were judged each according to his works. Notice that there's no books. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Also, a third resurrection, the one we don't want to think about. And anyone not found in the, written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. There's a whole sermon there. 
I'll get to it. Jose, I'll get to it. I promise you. <laughs> Ezekiel 37, he says, these verses cause a great deal of problems for those who believe we go to heaven or hell when we die. What is the purpose of this resurrection? Most do the usual. They ignore it. But this is obviously a physical resurrection. Not the first resurrection to spirit, but a physical, physical resurrection. It is amazing promise of Ezekiel 37 verse 14. Talks about bringing them out of the graves. And I will put my spirit in you and you shall live and I will place you in your land. Then and only then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. There will be a change for all of this world. Number six uh, of eternal judgment, Romans 6, 23. There are two eternal judgments mentioned, Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death. Notice it is not, it says death, not eternal punishment. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Not just life, but eternal spiritual life. Life devoid of limitations that we have now. He said, let me read to you three verses. You can just listen. I'm done. That'll be quick. First John 2.25. And this is the promise that he promised us. Eternal life. Ezekiel 18 verse 4. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. Verse 20, the soul who sins shall die. The Son shall not bear the guilt of the Father, nor the Father bear the guilt of the Son. The, righteous of the, the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. Everybody is going to give account for themselves. Matthew 23, 23, these are some wonderful truths. Understanding of which can only come from God. Matthew 23, 23. Woe you scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. How important are these three to God? Do we think of justice as a trait of God? the Father and Jesus Christ. Psalm 33, 4 from the New Living Translation simply says, as the word of the Lord holds true, we can trust everything he does. And then in Psalm 106, verse 3, blessed are those who keep justice and he who does righteousness at all times. The world is so warped that sometimes it is hard to know what justice is. How do you get justice from a, for a slave who died 200 years ago? Or a slave who died in Egypt long before Moses was born? Or you fill in the blank. The only answer is the return of Jesus Christ to this earth and his sitting, setting up his kingdom on this earth. Jesus will resurrect the dead and teach all his ways in a world of peace and prosperity. I love the, the mind of Mr. Spears. How about mercy? How about mercy? How about mercy? Matthew 5, verse 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Matthew 7, verse 1, Judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged, and with the measure you see, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye and do not consider the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. First Corinthians 13, there is something about these verses that we need to think about. It does not say to look and see if you have a plank in your own eye. These verses make it plain that the plank is there. Are you merciful, loving, forgiving? Those traits are meat. Those traits are meat. If we are not at least trying to develop these traits, then we are still trying to digest milk. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1. 
Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. We will have love, or we will not be in the kingdom of God. Love suffers long and is kind. Verse 13, and now abide faith, hope, love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Hebrews 11, verse 1. You know, sometimes the transitions, because the, these were not written for a sermon. These were written for a discussion that we would have. So some of the transitions are not, not so easy. Hebrews 11, verse 1. The Bible makes plain that faith is a vital part of salvation. Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Verse 6. But without faith, Without conviction, without belief, it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Faith is that important. Go over to Matthew 6, verse 12. How important is forgiveness? How important is forgiveness? Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debts. And do not lead us into temptation but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespass, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespass, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. You know, we're not unique. We all have been hurt by somebody. We all have someone that we need to forgive. Psalm 103, very quickly. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Even when we forgive someone, it's it kind of hard to let go. God has forgiven us. God uses east and west because they never meet. North and south meet. East and west never meet. He said we can, uh, Rex continues, he says we can say we have forgiven someone, but is this really true if we keep bringing it up, even if, we're just, even if we're just thinking about it? It's not a minor point. When we are kings and priests in the world tomorrow, some of the people we are going to deal with are going to have been reprehensible in our lives. Let us never forget that God is going to offer these people a chance at salvation. The good, the bad, and the ugly. He said, one last thought. I have always wondered about the church of God down through the ages, dark ages, the middle ages and such. They obviously did not have the insight into prophecy that we have. Not that we are smarter than they were, but much is obvious to us through hindsight, through history. Many of these called, many of these called probably, uh, again, we do not know, could not read or write. Education wasn't high on their list. But that did not mean they could not live by faith or show godly love toward one another. Or you could say that they had the fruits of God's spirit. Mr. Pebworth talked about being a comforter for one another. It has been my privilege to have Mr. Spears as my comforter. We would discuss things constantly, either by the internet or by phone. We shared from our experiences. And I can only encourage you to have the same experience with one another. Share the journey with each other. Comfort each other with God's word. Grow in grace and knowledge with God's word with one another. This is not a solo journey. We're not by ourselves. I hope this was helpful.